the time that I got up this morning um, and then all afternoon long just been reflecting, reflecting on what it means to be a father, uh, to be a pastor. And um, I love my family with all my heart. I cannot tell you uh, the number of times that I have just been so thankful uh, for what God has done in my life and blessed me with an incredible family. I'm truly a man and a father and a husband that does not deserve what he has. I do not. But I'm thankful for a beautiful wife, an amazing wife. I'm thankful for a wife that loves God, and loves the work of God, loves her children. And uh, I'm so thankful that, that God uh, has put them in my life. So my heart is full today. And I understand the responsibility of being a father. And I'm learning in this thing. So many of you, you've got children that are older than seven years old. And you have, have uh, been there, been there before me. You've paved the way, uh, Sister Marjorie, before me. And you've, you've seen things and experienced things. And all I know to do is just trust in God. I'm not a perfect man. I'm not a perfect pastor. Not a perfect husband. I'm not a perfect father. But I know a God who is perfect. And I'm thankful that if we put our trust in Him, it's all going to be all right. Amen? Why don't you clap your hands and thank God for the Spirit of the Lord today. Amen. I pray that uh, I pray that I do not preach very long right now. I just want to kind of give you something that's on my heart. I believe that the Lord will bless you. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 8. Again, as you're turning there, always a privilege to see everyone in the house of God. And uh, good to have John Thomas's dad with us again. Good to have John Thomas. Amen. We love and appreciate what God is doing. What a miracle that God has worked in his life. Amen. And so awesome. And uh, God did that because he loves you. Amen. He did that because he loves you. And there is a great work for John Thomas. There's a great work for every father, every person here. There's a great work for you. So today, I'm going to be preaching to the fathers, but I'm also going to be preaching just to the whole church. So um, just let the words fall where they're supposed to fall, and God will help us today. Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse number 8. Amen. Just one simple scripture, but a very powerful scripture nonetheless. When thou buildest a new house... Everybody say new house. Then thou shalt make a battlement. Everybody say wall. Then thou shalt make a battlement for thy roof. That thou bring not blood upon thine house. If any man fall from thence. The Jews... Those in the Middle East, they had a certain way they built their homes. And the roof of the homes was designed, they were flat, and they were all designed where people would go up, entire families would go up and would dwell or um, not live, but they would actually have times of gathering and, and family time up on the roof. And so it's interesting to me, Brother Kevin, how... There was a commandment given by God to build a wall up around the edges of that house so that anyone up there wouldn't by accident fall because if they fell, then the blood would be required on the hands of the builder of that house. So I want to talk to you with the help of the Lord for just the next few moments today about a wall in a dangerous place. Amen. A wall in a dangerous place. If you would, lift your hands and let's pray to the Lord. Lift your voice with me today. Jesus, I love you. I thank you for the power of your spirit. God, I thank you for what you're going to do here today. I thank you for talking to hearts and lives. God, I pray that you would help me right now to deliver this word to your people. I thank you, God, for your goodness and mercy, knowing we don't deserve it. I give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Everybody say in Jesus' name. Could you clap your hands to the Lord before you're seated today? Praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you so much for standing and worshiping the Lord today. There was a father who had 
five children and he had won a contest and in that contest he had won a toy in the contest he called all of his children together all of his kids to ask which of them of all the children that he had all five kids which of them deserved the toy which of them deserved the toy he asked the question who among you is the most obedient he said who never who among you never talks back to your mother who here does absolutely everything that your mom says and five small voices answered in unison okay dad you get the toy in all seriousness today we are to honor our fathers and our mothers but on this day in June it is set aside for us to honor the fathers of this country and we are to honor our fathers today not because it's a holiday not because it's a tradition but because there are people and fathers here today that are honored by God we're not doing it today because there's sales all over the country because there are Father's Day sales all over the country today but we are doing it because God said so in fact he said so very specifically in excuse me Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 1 the Bible says children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long upon the earth notice that it doesn't say honor only good moms and dads it doesn't say honor them only if you like them it doesn't say honor only the right ones it says honor your father and your mother and so today we ought to honor all fathers I want to speak directly here today to dads for a moment and if you're not a dad then don't check out because everybody needs to hear this you see we are all involved in a war today there is a battleground that is happening today and it is not in Iraq it is not in Afghanistan but the battleground is in our homes and what's at stake is not our land what's at stake is not our freedom it's not our property but it's more important than that but dads today what is at stake is our children and believe me it is a war it's a very important war and in this country I believe that they are losing the battle children are turning from God in record numbers it's as if as soon as they leave home and they go away to college they leave the church but it's nothing new it's the same that has been raging over the course of time a passage from Romans chapter 1 beginning with verse 28 tells us the close parallels that's going on in the country today Romans 1 and 28 and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do the things which are not convenient being filled with all unrighteousness fornication wickedness covetousness maliciousness full of envy murder debate deceit malignity and whispers backbiters haters of God despiteful proud boasters inventors of evil things disobedient to parents without understanding covenant breakers without natural affection implacable unmerciful who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them further 
Furthermore, from what the Bible tells us, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do things that ought not to be done. When I look around and I survey the world today, I see people doing things that ought not to be done. I was just made aware of a situation that happened back in May of this year, I believe it was, where two young girls, the age of 12 years old, I believe, went to a birthday party of a friend and they lured the birthday girl out into the woods and they had a knife with them. They pinned her to the ground and stabbed her multiple times in the arms and in the chest and in the stomach to this 12 year old girl is hanging on for dear life. The reason they said they did it is because they went to a very popular website that I was only made privy to upon reading this article last week. And they went to this website that told creepy stories. Stories designed to scare children. Stories designed to spook children. And because they engaged in those stories, they felt like they would live them out by proxy of some of the creators and authors of these stories. Now I know that, that people, when they hear these things, they blame the website, they blame the internet, and truth of the matter is, those things do need to be blamed because they do have part in it. But I, I have a, a very, very, very serious concern when parents in the world today do not know what their 12-year-olds in their house are reading or watching or listening to. I've come to tell you, we live in a battleground. There is a war zone going on. Somebody help me today. And it is time that godly fathers and godly mothers and godly parents and grandparents rise to the occasion to say, not in my house. Children today are filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy. They're full of murder and strife and deceit and malice. The Bible declares that they are gossipers, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. The Bible tells us, Brother Jamal, that they actually invent ways of doing evil. That's what kind of world that we're living in today. That's what kind of world that our children and grandchildren are being raised in today. In a world that evil isn't good enough, they've got to create and invent evil. They disobey their parents. They are slanderers. They're senseless. They're faithless. They're heartless. And they're ruthless. And although they know God is righteous, and although they may know that if they do these things, they'll suffer punishment and go to hell, Many of them don't even care. But I've come to preach to you today that the word of God tells us that we as apostolic parents, we as apostolic families need to rise up and say it's not going to happen in our church. It's not going to happen in my home. It's not going to happen in my family. We got to build a wall. Somebody say build a wall. Reading in our scripture text, Deuteronomy 22 and 8, the tops of the houses in ancient Judea as in the east still were very flat and they would they would compose these roofs of branches and twigs and they would lay them across large beams and they covered them with a cement of clay or a strong plaster if you will then they were commanded to build a wall around the outside edge of the roof a wall that is about chest high to a man. These walls would act as a fence, if you will. In the summertime, the roof was a very favorite resort and still is a favorite resort for families. In the summertime, as the day would begin to cool, they would get up on top of the roof and they would eat, they would drink and they would have family time. But accidents would frequently happen not necessarily from full-grown adults, but from children playing too close to the edge on their own homes. 
children, Brother Barry, playing too close to the edge of their own homes. And as they incautiously would approach the edge, no one watching, no one paying attention, numerous accidents where the children would fall off down into the street or down into the court below and fall to their death. So it was a very wise and a very prudent precaution in the Jewish legislature to provide that a stone or a timber railing be put around the roof should a form of, of essential as an essential part of the actual house that was built. In building a house, as we read in Deuteronomy, care must be taken to keep it safe. I've come to preach to you today that if you are building your house and you're raising your family in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, I've come to tell you that we better take care in building our house to keep our family safe. We need to make sure that garbage doesn't come into our homes, that our children may watch or listen to or play or be a part of that would cause them, come on somebody, to fall out of the house, to fall off of the roof and crash to their death if it was neglected if a roof was not if a roof did not include a, a banister or a battlement around the roof then if an accident happened mischief followed the owner of that house by his neglect oh I want you to hear me right now the blood of that child or that person falling to their death would be required at his hand when you consider how precious that lives are to God especially children's lives Jesus said if you even think about harming one of these little ones it'd be better than a millstone was hung about your neck and you were cast into the sea folks I don't know about you but God takes it serious hey you think you love your children I believe God loves your children more than you love your children I believe that God loves our children and he doesn't want to see any of us lead our children into failure. Oh, I want you to hear me right now. I'm not going to be an alcoholic because I don't want my children to be alcoholics. I'm not going to be a drug addict or a pervert because I don't want my children to engage in that type of behavior. My children are going to follow in my footsteps and I'm going to make sure those footsteps lead them to an apostolic church. Come on, somebody, and lead them to an apostolic altar of repentance. I'm going to teach them that if they make mistakes, that when they fail, they can find refuge with God. Oh, come on, clap your hands. I believe the Holy Ghost is here right now. Thank you, Jesus. Care must be taken. When you look at our spiritual house, we as fathers here today, we got a very big job ahead of us. There will be times, and I'm not going to tell you, I'll just tell you. There will be times when we won't see it coming. I'm not naive enough to believe here today, Brother Kevin, that just because I've built a wall up around my house, that my boys will never experience any part of the world. I'm not naive enough here today to believe that even though I build the walls up high, that they're not going to come in contact with somebody that might just change their life forever for the bad. I'm not naive enough to believe that today. I'm not naive, naive enough, Sister Wallace, to believe that the world, the culture of this world, that it is not out to attack my family. If we don't have our guard up, we're going to fall. If we don't have the right guardrails in place, we're going to fall if we don't have the right fences in place. We're going to fall. And it's so scary to think, Brother Lambert, it terrifies me to think that the blood of my children could be on my hands because I made the wrong mistake. Oh, thank God that right now today that I'm in the church of the living God, that I believe in repentance and mercy in Jesus' name baptism, that I believe in the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Thank God today. Oh, come on, somebody. Clap your hands and thank God with me. I'm 
so thankful for that second chance today. Do you realize that we live in a culture? Listen, folks, I, I knew I don't ever want to say that I was under protective. I'd rather be an overprotective dad than an underprotective dad any day of the week. You might think, well, brother, brother just let, I, when, when people say, let your kid little, li live a little bit. Hey, I want my kids to live. I don't want them to die. Right. Don't think I'm a bad dad because I don't let my kids bungee jump at the age of seven. Or go parachuting at the age of seven. They want to do that stuff, they'll have plenty of time when they're on their own. But as long as they're in my house and they're under my care, I'm going to teach them how to live. I'm going to teach them how to love. I'm going to teach them how to worship. Oh, come on, somebody. We've got to decide right now. We have to teach our families how to live and love and worship. I don't ever want it to say that they failed, that they fell because I did not build a railing, because I neglected them in my words with my time and with my life. You realize that we live in a culture that approves of its turning back on God. Do you understand that? We live in a culture, church, that thinks it's okay to turn your back on God. They think it's all a matter of choice if you decide not to live for the Lord. From court cases to popular TV shows and movies, they make fun of religion because it's not important, they say. It's not relevant, they say. Oh, it might have worked for mom and dad, but it's not going to work for me. I tell you today, moms and dads, we are at the front lines. This is a war, and we are called to be a part. You can pretend it's not happening. You can stick your head in the sand, but I've come to tell you, my children need a church that loves their soul. Your children need a church that loves their soul. And so we are called to look briefly at a few steps today that will help us fight the good fight. How can we win the war? Three steps. Everybody say, with words, with time, and with our lives. With our words, Deuteronomy 6 and 6, and these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down and when thou risest up. Listen to me. You need to talk to your children. I said you need to talk to your children. Brother Barry, you need to be heavily involved in your children's lives. You need to know what they're doing, where they're going, who they're talking to, what they're watching, what they're listening to, and what they're wearing. You need to know. The Bible says, you teach them diligently unto thy children. Talk of them when you're sitting in your house, when you're walking by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Talk to them. What God has done for you so that they can share it with others. I've got a question. Are you sharing it with your children? Are you talking to your children about what God does for you? About what God has done for us? I'm going to tell you something. I want my boys to know about healing. I want them to know when they get sick, you know what my boys ask? Daddy, pray for me. Mommy, pray for me. I never want them to not ask me that. I never want them. Yes, they need a prayer life of their own. Oh, but I love it, Sister Johnson, when they know that they can ask for prayer and God can heal them. A study was done recently to determine the amount of interaction between fathers and their small children. First, the fathers were asked to estimate the amount of time that they spent each day communicating with their child. The average answer each day that fathers communicated with their child was between 15 and 20 minutes only. Next, microphones were attached to the father so that each interaction 
could be recorded. The results of this study were shocking. The average amount of time spent by these, listen, middle class fathers with their small children was 37 seconds per day. Their direct interaction was limited to 2.7 encounters daily lasting 10 to 15 seconds each. Now I want you to look back at Deuteronomy 6 again with me. Can that be accomplished in 37 seconds per day? No. Do you want to know how much time the culture has with your children? 37 seconds does not come close at all to meeting the job. Communicate with your children. Tell them about God. Tell them about the Bible. Listen to me. Do not let the schools be the only thing that instructs your children. Don't even let this church be the only thing that instructs your children. If the only time you talk about God with your children is on Sunday or Wednesday, there's a problem. And that's not an indictment on the teaching ministry of this church. But mom and dad, I just want to tell you, we're not responsible for raising your children. You're responsible for raising your children. It's not the church's job, it's the parent's job. Dads, how are you doing with your words? Are you fighting off culture with your words? How do I do that, Brother Maroney? Well, when they come home and they say, well, so-and-so's doing it, I want to be just like them. Your words are going to mean the difference between heaven and hell in the lives of your children. Right there at that moment. If you say, it's okay, go ahead. And they fall into sin, guess whose fault it's going to be? It's very important that we answer our children correctly. With our time, Robert Schuler, pastor of the Crystal Cathedral, once said that he chose to fail so that he could succeed. Here's what he meant. He said, I chose to fail at golf because I wanted to succeed as a father. He knew how much he loved golf. And when he noticed that his golf time became more than his family time, I'm going to tell you something. You need to be willing to fail as a golfer, a hunter, a fisherman, a sports addict, a ball player. You need to, oh, come on, somebody. You need to choose. Oh, I'm either going to be a failure at that and a success at my children or a success at that and a failure to my children. We can't choose or make the wrong decision. I'm going to fail at my hobby so that I can be a good dad. Dads, you want to know what's important in your life today? Look at your calendar. Come on now. Look at your schedule. Does it involve your children? Ultimately, many dads say that, that by their time, they love their jobs. They love their hobbies. They love their entertainment. They love their comfort. And if you ask them if they love their children, they would swear up and down to you that they do, but their time does not measure up. And some of you have bought into the thinking of this world. I've got to keep on working and working and working so that I can afford the creature comforts. I love my children. I want my boys to have an Xbox. I want my boys to have toys. I want them to have all these things. So we work extra doubly and triply hard to make that happen. But what you got to understand is what your children needs more than anything is not an Xbox. What your children, if you got that, fine, fantastic. But not at the cost of a relationship with their father. A relationship with their family. First Kings 5, excuse me, First Timothy 5 and 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he have denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. If you don't provide for your family, the Bible says that you're worse than an infidel and that you've denied the faith. God doesn't, God doesn't approve of a dad that won't take care of his family. Come on now. But I think that sometimes we go beyond what is necessary 
The story is told of a man asking his daughter if she would want quality time with her dad or quantity of time with her dad. And she replied, quality time, dad, and lots of it. I believe my boys, I believe that they're precious enough that they deserve quantity time with their dad and quality time with their dad. Oh, I spend time with my kids. They run around me and play all day long as I watch TV all day long. That's not quality time. My boys want to go out in the backyard and they want to throw a frisbee. They want to throw a, before I had to go away to those camps, they wanted to throw a, a frisbee and play wiffle ball. And they wanted to play dodgeball. They wanted to do all those things and baseball, yeah, and all those things. They wanted to do all those things. And you know what dad did? I went out there and did it. You know why? Not because, I, because I'm physically fit, because I'm not. And there might have been a couple times where I said, where I said in my mind, if you only knew how I felt, you wouldn't be asking dad to come out here and do this. But I drug myself out there, hallelujah. And I threw the ball. And I like it because my boys are energetic enough because if, if the ball dropped, they just run out and pick it up for me and hand it to me. Here, dad. <laughs> they love it. We played dodgeball, lined them up against the fence while dad threw a ball at them. And then I let them throw the ball at me. And you know why I did that? Because I want to spend quality time with my kids. Listen, it may not always be the most convenient time. You may not feel like it most of the time. But I've come to tell you, it's going to mean something. I want them to grow up and know that whenever they needed dad, dad wasn't too busy. Or dad wasn't too tired. Or to come on somebody, that they've got a dad that loves them. So time is a gift that you give that you can never get back. You can, listen, folks, you can give money. You can give money. And you can always make more money. You can give gifts because you can always get new things and new gifts anyway. But once time is given, time never comes back. You understand that? Once your time is given... It never comes back. And time will reveal the priorities in your life. If you want to win the war with your children, you got to invest time. And lastly, you got to invest your lives. Genesis 18, 18 and 19 is a very revealing passage. God is about to destroy, and I want everybody to hear me. God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, but he decides, Brother Lambert, to share Abraham, with Abraham his plans. He said, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? And John, here's why he did it. Genesis 18 and 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him but listen to verse 19 for i know him that he will command his children and his household after him that they shall keep the way of the lord to do justice and judgment that the lord may bring upon abraham that which he has spoken of him you know why that the lord felt so confident to, to tell abraham his plans is all because he knew that abraham would be a dad to his family he knew that he would build a wall in a dangerous place. Folks, we live in a dangerous place. We live in a dangerous world. And God is looking for dads today that will stand up and build a wall in a dangerous place. Your kids may not understand why you won't let them go here. Why you won't let them watch that. Why you won't let them do this or do that. They may not understand. But I want to tell you kids, it's because your dad wants to be a wall in a dangerous place. If you're going to get my kids, you're going to have to come through this wall. Come on, somebody. If you're going to get my children, you're going to have to come through this wall first. Your kids will emulate who you are. I want them, I want them to learn how to worship because their dad worshiped. I want them to learn how to praise God because their mom and dad praise God. There's a song that I believe Phillips Craig and Dean sang. We've, we've done it here I don't know how many times. I want to be just like you. 
It goes like this. I want to be just like you because he wants to be just like me. I want to be a holy example for his innocent eyes to see. Help me be a living Bible Lord that my little boy can read. I want to be just like you because he wants to be like me. And I can see that now in my boys. Colin and Connor, seven years of age. And I love it. They don't have to, they don't have to wear a tie to church. But even as early as a couple years ago, back when they were five years old, maybe even earlier, they wanted to wear a tie because dad wore it. When they put a suit on, they didn't go, oh, I don't want to wear this. This is horrible. We'd get them dressed for church and they'd put that coat on. And Brother Kevin, come running down the hallway of the house. Look, Dad, I look just like you. I want to be just like him because they want to be just like me. Do you understand the magnitude of what I'm talking about today? Your children can follow you into heaven or hell. Your choice. When they're children, it's your choice. Oh, but Brother Maroney, what happens when they get older? What happens when they move out of the house? Train up a child in the way that it should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. Train up a child in the way that it should go. God forbid if anything bad like that happened to my boys where they stopped living for God. I'm against it. I'm against it. I will fight it with my last breath. But you hear me, it's not going to be because I taught them how to be worldly. Come on, somebody. It's not going to be because I taught them how to sin. It's not going to be because I taught them. Listen, you have an opportunity right now with your children. And then in the future with your grandchildren, you have an opportunity right now. Hey, if you don't have any kids here today, guess what? You have an opportunity with the children of this church. As I talked about earlier, adopt some kids in the church and be an example to them. Hey, I know. I know that your children are your children. But I want to be an example to your children. I know these kids, Brother Sister Lambert, I know they're your children. Brittany, I know, John, I know they're your children. But I want to help you be an example to those children too. I want them to know that it's okay to worship God when they come to church. I want them to know that it's okay to commit to God. I want them to know that sin is bad and it'll take you to hell. And I'm not going to live that way. I'm not going to fall into sin because I don't want your children to fall into sin. Stand with me right now. Lift your hands to heaven. If we help each other, help each other, we can help take the families and the children of this church to heaven. What kind of an example are you being for your kids? Are they going to mirror you? Yes, they will. Are they mirroring, mirroring your actions? Your words may say some things about you, but your life declares who you really are. Are you fighting the war with your lives? Are you protecting them as much as you can by placing walls of protection all around them? I want you to lift your hands, everybody in this place right now. And I want you to pray, moms and dads alike. God, help me build walls around my roof. Help me, God, to build a battlement around my roof for my children and my grandchildren. I don't want them to fall off. I don't want them to fall to the ground and die. I don't want them to lose out or miss out.